I'm going to just give it 30 seconds as folks are joining. <clears throat> Hi everyone. Um, thanks for thanks for joining us. I'm Anne Marie Youths from Foley and Lardner. Um, I'm a partner in our Detroit office focused on manufacturing. Um, this is our first coffee break with SAA. Foley is really happy to be the exclusive legal sponsor with SAA. I sit on its board. It's been a great relationship for the last couple of years. Um, Foley is a full service law firm. We've got you know, 25 offices worldwide, 1200 plus lawyers. Um, one of the four sectors that we focus on is manufacturing. So I like to say our sweet spot is manufacturing and even closer to my sweet spot and my partners who you'll meet today is automotive. Um, so we're going to discuss today some AI issues that are timely in the industry related to connectivity and advanced manufacturing and talk about it from a legal perspective. Um, I'd like to introduce my partner, Nick Ellis. Um, Nick is in our Detroit office and Nick is all things supply chain. Um, he works up and down the automotive chain. We represent a lot of suppliers. Um, we represent some OEs, especially in the electric space as well. So um, Nick is going to join us, and we're happy to be joined by our partner, Shabi Khan, um, who also works in manufacturing and is really connected with these AI issues, as you will hear from him as he opens up his remarks. Um, we are going to do this quarterly, um, so thank you for joining for the first one. We will be back in May. I would really invite your feedback. So it's a 15 minute quick hit. Uh, we're gonna try to give you some informative um, points today and you can always follow up with us. But as well, if you have suggestions on things for the May coffee break, we really welcome those. Um, so thank you to Kevin and everybody at SAA for setting this up. And with that, Shabi, I'm gonna hand it to you. Thanks, Anne-Marie. Um, and thank you everybody for attending. This is 15 minutes, so I'm gonna to try to talk fast so we can get as much information to you all um, as we can. Um, I think we're gonna go over three uh, big topics. I'll talk about ownership of data and other intellectual property, and then Nick will cover the, the other two. Uh, but to the extent people have questions, feel free to use the chat to type in whatever you want. We'll try to get to them. Otherwise, reach out to us after this and we're happy to chat more. <clears throat> So just talking about AI in general, I think people have heard data is the new oil as a cliche. I think it still holds true. And with AI, it's becoming more and more important to understand the relationship of data uh, when, when talking about uh, partnerships with AI vendors. So, you know, assuming you're a manufacturing plant or a facility, you might be trying to integrate AI into your workforce. Uh, that might mean partnering with an AI vendor, or AI solution, uh, and so forth. Uh, in a traditional relationship, the manufacturing plant will give access to certain amounts of data to these AI vendors, which can then process and parse that data, providing meaningful insights and action items that can help improve the performance uh, of your manufacturing plant. Uh, this could extend beyond manufacturing, as you can imagine, telematics for automotive driving or autonomous driving and so forth, but keeping true to the theme of manufacturing, let's just assume that it's typically an AI vendor that's trying to partner with a facility to deploy AI. Uh, what are some of the issues that pop up um, that I think companies or manufacturing plants should be thinking about? Uh, obviously ownership of data. And, and I say that broadly because it's not just ownership, but it's also the data usage rights that extend from it. So, you know, you may enter into an agreement saying that you own the data, but the AI vendor may obtain certain rights to use that data in certain ways. Um, where I think things get tricky is how much you know, how many rights you're giving away with respect to that data and what do you consider to be proprietary for yourself? Um, for AI vendors, their goal is to collect data from a whole bunch of different manufacturing facilities, uh, you know, not, not just for you, but from others, and then sort of 
try to aggregate that data and compound the value of the aggregated data. Uh, the what that means for a manufacturing facility is it loses you lose your bargaining power when you try to license that data separately. So just being aware of the issues around who owns what rights and what rights you're giving away is important. Uh, AI vendors, for example, in their in the agreements that you'll typically enter it with them will have some language that says, we can use your data to improve our products and services. Uh, and that's a pretty broad definition because they can define products and services extremely broadly to even cover cases that they haven't even thought about you know, at the time they signed the agreement. So for example, with generative AI, a lot of companies are now saying, oh, we already got the rights to use their data to improve our products and services, which means we can use their data to train our generative AI models or use it for you know, other issues. So just appreciating the nuances around data ownership, the rights to use and, and restrictions around it. One of the important restrictions that you always wanna think about is when you terminate a relationship with a vendor, you wanna make sure that they uh, delete that data uh, so that you kind of retain ownership of it. Sometimes they won't agree to that, but that's a sticky point. Uh, that warrants sort of a further discussion on how you want to handle it. Um, I'll quickly touch upon like other intellectual uh, property issues. Obviously, when you're starting in, uh, to work with an AI vendor, you know you most likely will come to the table and say, "How can you help us?" And there'll be some collaboration. We advise clients on both sides to actually come prepared with some patent filings in advance, so that you've already marked the territory of where you think your innovations may lie. Sometimes it's, hey, uh, use this data to improve you know, the performance of some material or uh, a fastening technique of screws. And if you've already got those ideas in place, you might want to consider filing. Last thing I'll say about IP is with generative AI, um, there are issues that are creeping up around inventorship and authorship. So content that's output by generative AI in the US at least, uh, typically is not copyright protectable unless a user or an author has provided significant human contribution to the prompts and sort of work through the generative AI model. Um, so without copyright protection, what that means is you've got limited rights in terms of other people may be able to use the same designs or whatever else, materials that you've generated through, cop uh, through generative AI for their own benefit. Um, and then from an inventorship standpoint, if you ask ChatGPT, how would you solve this problem or give me solutions, you kind of start running the risk of uh, not being an inventor and therefore those ideas may not be protectable. There are carve outs, happy to chat more about them, but um, with seven minutes left, I want to turn it over to Nick. Thank you, Shabi, and thank you, everybody. Uh, you know, I'm going to talk a little bit about everybody's, uh, if we go back to the last slide, back to the last slide, please. I'm going to talk about everybody a little bit about everybody's favorite topic in the world, which is liability and how do you apportion the costs between the parties when things go wrong? Uh, I know as we're getting into these uh, new relationships, new technologies, there's at least the hope that everything is going to go smoothly and we're not going to have uh, any significant bumps in the road. But unfortunately, as we've all experienced in the past, you know, the best laid plans of mice and men usually go awry and something is probably going to happen at some point. And the hope is just that it's it's nothing major. Uh, but if it is, you want to have uh, a good division of responsibility set up in the contract so you're not having to fight about that later. You know, most of where you know, I think we're currently seeing these AI and connectivity issues come into play. A lot of it is you know, in the manufacturing systems and uh, you know, in the equipment itself, which always in the automotive industry, as we all know, the <coughs> biggest risk is an interruption in production, which can result in significant liability. And so when that occurs, you have to think about, well, who, who ultimately is going to have to pay the cost for that? Do I have recourse against my vendors, either the provider of the equipment, the provider of the software? You know, where does that responsibility lie? And you know, the tricky part in a lot of cases is going to be figuring out well, who has you know the responsibility for the integration of those two. So when there's a production issue, is that something you know that flows from the software? Is that something that flows from the equipment? 
And do I have you know, one point of responsibility that I can look to on those issues? Um, yeah, there, there's really no great magic to how you can deal with that. It comes down to the basic blocking and tackling of your contracts and having good agreements in place. Uh, you, you want to understand what, what are the warranties, you know, what are the indemnity provisions, you know, what are the responsibilities of the parties? And then critically, you know, what are any limitations of liability that you may have had to accept as part of those contracts? You know, I often tell people I, I can have the best warranties and the best indemnity provisions in the world. But if there's a limitation of liability that says, uh, you know, the most I can recover is, you know, return of the purchase price. And now all of a sudden I'm staring down the barrel of a $10 million charge from my OEM customer for a prolonged shutdown. That's not going to get me very far. So you have to understand, you know, what it is you're signing up to, you know, what are the rights uh, and recourses that you have, which leads a little bit into the third topic here, which is uh, the risks that are inherent in a lot of these new relationships uh, that many suppliers are having to get into as they start to explore these new technologies and these new approaches to manufacturing. A lot of the time, you're not going to be dealing with your traditional automotive customers. Uh, and you know, a lot has been made about the clash of cultures between the automotive industry and Silicon Valley. And well, in some cases, that may be overblown. There, there, there is um, you know, realism to it. I think a lot of people outside the automotive industry, they look at the contracts and the terms and conditions that are, that are standard in the automotive industry and we all take for granted. And th those can generate some pushback at times. You know, when you're dealing with these new technologies, especially AIs, a lot of the time you find yourself dealing with uh, kind of extreme ends of the spectrum. Uh, as far as your partners, you may be dealing with a, a Microsoft or a Google, somebody who is the proverbial 800 pound gorilla in their own area, and you're going to have very limited ability to push back and negotiate on the terms. You, you may very well be in a situation where uh, you just have to either accept you know, the terms that they are offering or you're not going to be able to use that technology and that software. And you know those types of contracts are likely going to be very favorable to uh, the vendor, and limit your your limit your recourse. On the other end of the spectrum, you may be dealing with a company that is more in the realm of a startup or a newer company. And while you may have greater leverage to try and negotiate contract terms with those uh, types of vendors. You know, there's going to be concerns about you know can the vendor really stand behind those obligations both from a performance standpoint at times or from a liability standpoint. Um, again, you know, I can have I can have the best indemnity provision in the world with no limitation of liability. But if the other side doesn't have the assets to uh, support when I have to and make good when I come claiming for a $10 million shutdown charge, you know, that contract is not going to be worth the paper it's printed on. And so th those are risks that you have to deal with. And it, it critical to this is really just understanding, you know, what are the who who are you getting into business with? You know, what what is this company? What's its capabilities? You know, what's its assets? Can it really stand behind what it's committing to? Uh, and yeah. make sure. Nick, I was just going to say the other thing to think about is when you're dealing with smaller or newer companies, trust becomes a big factor. You know, how much data are you willing to provide to them? Uh, and can you trust that they're going to keep it secure? Like when you're thinking about partnering with a Microsoft or an Apple or a Google, you, you know that that data is going to be secure. And so sometimes cybersecurity breaches and confidentiality comes into play depending on the nature of your, your entity or your business as well. Absolutely. Uh, so, you know, what... To close, while, while AI and connectivity have the potential for great benefits in manufacturing, both in terms of efficiency and output, you know, they do come with risks. It is important to make sure that you understand who you are dealing with, make sure you are complying with all the applicable laws and regulations surrounding uh, data and privacy, and make sure that you have appropriate contractual protections in place and understand the risks that you may be left with. Moving on to the next slide. 
just want to put in a quick plug for our next upcoming event. We're going to have Lunch and Learn on March 21st, scheduled for 2 o'clock uh, to 3 o'clock. Uh, more details coming soon, but we will be covering uh, the legal outlook and key issues going forward for 2024. And with that, we are right at 1115. I want to thank everybody for joining us here and enjoy the rest of your day.